what has happened over time is that um, sometime in the maybe the late 1980s, this idea began to, to show up that you as an individual shouldn't ever have to experience anything you don't want to experience. You shouldn't ever have to feel anything you don't want to feel. You shouldn't ever have to take feedback that you find icky to hear. You shouldn't ever have to have to deal with ideas or perspectives that, that, that you don't like listening to or that don't make you feel good. And this idea kind of grew and mutated until um, the, uh, the culture changed with it. Um, you know, we're, we're in a place now where these really, you know, it, it started as an idea, but it really is the norm here now uh, that nobody should have to feel anything they don't want to feel or do anything they don't want to do. No one should ever be exposed to feedback from reality. As a matter of fact, you don't have to take anything from reality at all. You can simply deny it or criminalize it or, um, you know, you can refuse it outright, you know, it, whatever it is. And over time, you know, the, the culture has changed and, and we're raising our children differently now. And, and you know, at least two generations of children have, have come into the world thinking that this is the way life's supposed to work. Um, and what's re even more disturbing is even the folks that are old enough to have known this lesson. I mean, I'm in my 50s. So this is, so when, when I grew up, uh, you, you were responsible for yourself. You didn't tattle. You always carried your own water. No one else had to take care of you. You never acted out. You never made other human beings carry you when times were tough. This was a different place. But even people are my age who learned those lessons growing up are starting to kind of surrender into this idea that they shouldn't have to feel these things anymore, which is kind of common sense because the idea that you don't you, you don't have to take responsibility for yourself in the world is really an idea that sells itself welcome dan hey thank you for having me yeah it's a pleasure to have you on the show so what i'd love to start with is for you to share with us your personal story because all of your search for having better solutions it stemmed from helping the people who are your clients but it also stemmed from a personal search for you to heal and change yourself so it would be great for our audience to hear about what that was all about for you okay um you know it, it Though my process really started you know, when I was 14, year old, uh, 14 years old, I lost my dad in an accident. And as you can imagine, for any, if you've lost someone close to you, that, that caused me some difficulty, left some scars. I, I didn't, at the time, I didn't process that event very well. Um, and, and so I moved into adulthood with some real, um, some real baggage. Uh, regarding myself and my place in the world and these types of things. And when I, I joined the army and, and went through that process and then went to college afterward and in college, I, you know, I, I studied many different things, but I started to meet uh, people and, you know, it, kind of people that were really making an impression on me. Um, it, they were largely teachers, academics, intellectuals, things like this. But what I was learning was that there were people out there with ideas that could it really impacted the way I thought and felt and seemed to, I thought at the time they were really, I felt smarter. I felt more competent. I felt, uh, like I was making progress. Like I was getting control of whatever this issue had, I had that I was carrying. Um, spoiler alert. At this point in my life, I, I kind of have a sense that that was the wrong way to do this. But at the time, it really felt very helpful. And so, you know, I began to kind of move through the world and meet these sort of amazing people. And, and one of the byproducts of losing a parent at a young age is you, you will probably look for their replacement somewhere. Uh, and what, what I was doing was actively looking for replacement. And I happened to accidentally uh, learn that um, the only true way to really learn something is to form a relationship with someone and spend a great deal of time with them, to really apprentice yourself to them. That there was something particular inside 
uh, a mentor mentee relationship, an apprentice teacher relationship that was that that's where it was at. And I, I had a couple of relationships with teachers like that during college. And these people were, were wonderful enough to indulge me and spend a great deal of time. And I was that student who would spend lots of time in your office asking you questions and reading books and doing things that weren't on the syllabus. And, and I was sort of in this period of kind of exploration of all things intellectual and, and all of that. But what I actually learned was this thing about the mentor-mentee relationship, that, that this apprentice model was really what changed your life. And I didn't realize what I was learning at the time, but that's what I was learning. And, and in the process of doing that, Outside of, of college, I happened to stumble into um, my first real teacher, and his name was Father Gary Fromm, and he was a retired Episcopalian priest and poet. And I formed a relationship with him, and, and that relationship was a decidedly not intellectual one, at least not on his part. It was on mine. But um, he was one of the first people that really um, changed my life because I spent enough time with him to come to emulate him to really take on the things that he thought and believed and his attitudes and values and those kind of things. And I, I took them on and, and, and it profoundly changed who I was. And, and, I, and so I had this amazing series of learnings with him, but it really kind of solidified this idea that, that that's how, at least for me, that's, I knew that that's what I was looking for. That's the kind of relationship I wanted to have. That's how I wanted to learn. And from Father Fromm, I, I, you know, I was in graduate school at the time. Uh, I was able to, of course, meet a lot, of, a lot more uh, you know, academics and graduate people. And at the same time, I became interested in um, alternative health care, um, particularly um, traditional Tibetan systems of medicine, traditional uh, Ayurvedic systems of medicine. Uh, during the same period of time, I went to massage school. Um, I traveled. I learned acupuncture. Uh, in traditional Chinese medicine. Interestingly enough, my this looking for, for people to apprentice myself to, I found in the middle of the Midwest, in the middle of North Dakota, a, um, a, a Taoist uh, Chinese physician who was living in Fargo because his wife was in school. And he was a wonderful man who took me on and I apprenticed myself to him and, and you know, and, and experienced Taoism and uh, traditional Chinese medicine and acupuncture, and he was a wonderful teacher. and And I have been able to apprentice myself to Hindu monks and Christian mystics and a whole assortment of people, you know, all over the United States and the world who were kind enough to let me really apprentice myself to them and spend a great deal of time with them. Um, and this sort of so. I, I, so can I just ask you when you say it, when you say it profoundly changed your life, tell us like mm -hmm. what what do you mean by that? What happened? What changed? You know, I mean, it, it, they're they're basic big picture lessons that you get in a in a relationship like that. Um, being able to forgive yourself and love yourself, um, uh, you know, or being able to forgive and love others, at least taking steps in that direction. Um, taking responsibility for yourself in the world, um, pursuing your goals, uh, not being afraid, just, you know, the, the lessons that you need to, to mature, to grow up. And, and that I didn't realize that at the time that those ideas came to sh to be shaped later by, um, my interactions with Scott McFall, which is what the bigger picture is about. But really this idea that, so much of what we do as helpers or as mentors or as teachers or as trainers is really to, to mature people from, from a big picture, from a universal archetypal perspective that what we're doing is we, we encounter these folks and, you know, we look at them as human beings and we figure out, you know, what experiences do they need to have to get where they need to go? You can think about it like parenting. You know, uh, not in any kind of superior sense or anything like that, but but just that 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 really universally has been the task of of all great teachers, helpers. Uh, you know, I think it, I think maybe it was supposed to be the path that mental health took. I just don't believe anymore that that's 
um, the perspective that they have. If, if we had that at one point in time as a field, I think we've lost track of it, which is, which is a problem. Um, but it really is that task of growing up, of having someone listen to you, really see you, and then hold you accountable for, for who you are in the world and require that you take responsibility for yourself and, and say what you want to say and do what you want to do and not make, not find a way out of that when things get hard, you know, just the task that you would do for your children. Mm-hmm. If you think about it that way, one of the most useful pieces of information that I got from Scott McFall when I was first working with him was to treat the people that came to see me like I would treat my children. And if I kept that mindset, I would be fine. And that, that makes it, makes my work a lot clearer. I see people a lot more clearly and know what I should do a lot, a lot more effectively that way. So this has been kind of a, an evolving process that, that ultimately took me, I, this is a funny story and I put it in the book, but I met Scott. I, I live in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. Um, I've rarely worked here, but I've lived here for 25 years. Um, clear back in the late 1990s, um, Scott had a hypnosis clinic here in Sioux Falls. He had a, 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 an array of them across the upper Midwest. And one of them that he started was here in Sioux Falls. And, and when he opened up a hypnosis clinic, um, I... I have been able to, I studied hypnosis in graduate school, did my dissertation on Ericksonian hypnosis in psychotherapy supervision. Um, and I'd had a chance to, to really kind of cut my teeth with, well, primarily with Stephen Gilligan, who was one of Milton Erickson's original students. And Stephen was an, this amazing person to learn from and be with. And I spent a good couple of years trying to really apprentice myself to him and doing as much as I, I could do along those lines. So I really thought I had something, you know, I, I, that I, I, I really was rolling around in hypnosis at that point in time. And so this Scott McFall opens this clinic and I'm thinking, okay, I'm going to go meet him. And so I walked into his clinic and it was an entirely different experience. It was unlike anything I'd ever encountered before. The only way I, I the way I explain it to people is, is Scott took one look at me and I think thought about me the same way we were just talking about it. He looked at me and and said, okay, you know, where is he going and what experiences does he need to have? (laughs) And then he went about giving me those experiences right then and there. And I was really rattled by that. Um, I mean, what he kind of saw what I was, where I wanted to go and what I was doing and told me it wasn't going to work. And I was just like, "Uh, you know, I mean, I can't imagine the amount of time and effort I've got in this project at that point in time. And he says, yeah, you're not going to find what you're looking for that way. And here's why. And, you know, you really, you, you know, it's not going to work. It's just, you know, he told me many other things, but that was really, that really derailed me. Um, and it turned the interaction very negative for me. And I didn't, I was confused. And I didn't know what to do. And I became very frustrated. I left his office didn't talk to him for a decade, <laughs> 10 years. I went on and kind of was doing things the way I was originally doing them. And finally in the process, it, I'm not, I'm not figuring it out. I'm not making the progress I want to make. I'm going further into academic psychology and, and exploring that and just not getting the results, not only to be able to change myself, but to really be able to help other people in the way I really felt like I either wanted to help them or felt like they needed. And I, I, I just, I kept looking for that set of tools, that, that way of, of seeing things. Couldn't find it. Never materialized. I went down a lot of rabbit holes, a lot of alleys, couldn't find anything. And one day I'm sitting around and I'm, I'm, I'm periodically thinking about Scott during this 10 year period. Um, and finally I realized I had to call him again and I did. And this book really starts a bigger picture starts at the, my first interaction with him when he was running that clinic in Sioux Falls 
So I, I was lucky enough to get a sneak peek at the actual book. And I remember in that description yeah. of you meeting him, I think it would be really interesting and useful for people to hear about like what that was like in terms of the, the interaction you had and the, the, the feedback he gave you beyond what you said so far. There was a lot about the, the way the dynamics were happening. Can you tell us more about that? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, it, again, so... I'm, I'm just out of graduate school. I got my doctorate. I'm a licensed psychologist. I'm a professor of psychiatry at the University of South Dakota School of Medicine. Um, back to that whole smarty pants thing, right? And I waltz into his office and introduce myself to him as one hypnotist to another. You know, hey, how you doing? You know, just to kind of build a relationship and explore that. And he... Um, he could, he could just, he could see me when I arrived. You know, he, he kind of took one look at me and knew why I was there and what I wanted and very quickly sort of gathered a sense of, of where I wanted to go, you know. Um, and then really the, the, the thing about uh, that first interaction with him was he challenged all of that very quickly and very completely. I mean, telling me that he knew what I was looking for and I wasn't going to find it. And that's really derailing when, uh, you know, when you just meet somebody and, and they tell you, um, I know what you're looking for and they're right. And I didn't, I didn't know what to do with that at the time other than become confused and frustrated it's not the interaction I wanted to have with him. It's not the, it, it, you know, that's not what I was looking for when I got there. And so it, it was, it really threw me off my game. And I kind of made my excuses at that point in time and left. Um, but the conversation stayed in my head for 10 years, you know, mm -hmm. so. And a lot of this is that, that the way that you chose to cope with the emotional pain you had when your mm -hmm. when your dad passed away was to be in your head and, and really achieve that way. Mm -hmm. And and if you're in mm -hmm. your head that it distracts you from your emotions. And here he he was right. like trying to show you, hey, <laughs> being in your head is not gonna fix this. And and then you persevered right. because it was so uncomfortable to admit mm -hmm. that you needed to go mm -hmm. at it a different way. I couldn't I couldn't have admitted it at that point. I didn't even understand. I couldn't even see where he was coming from at that point in time. It literally took me the better part of, of a decade then to really admit that, that, yeah, okay, I get it now. He was right. This isn't going to work, you know? And, it, and I went out on my own because that's, you know, that's kind of how I learn. And it's not a great way to learn. But at that point in time, that's how I was doing it was I had to come up with my own answers. You know, I, I had to work this out for myself. You had a huge amount of pride associated with keeping things the way they were and a whole world that supported you in that because you had all these really mm -hmm. impressive academic credentials and accomplishments and anybody from the outside mm -hmm. would say, wow, right? Like, this is impressive. Right. And yeah, and here this guy who... And that's that's exactly why I went into that because I, I thought that that would, you know, that you learn all those things and you become all those things and that somehow, you know... Uh, you'll be able to handle it now. You'll, you can fix whatever goes wrong. You can help people. You can deal with whatever it is you bring to the table. All of these things are just going to come with these achievements and they don't, they, and they don't, and they never do. And, um, you know, and that really, again, was a lesson that I, you know, I, I because I'm a slow learner <laughs> and I tend to learn painfully, um, you know, I, I went out and had this, this long lesson um, before I, I finally f was able to come to the end of it and say, yeah, I, I, there are other ways to do this. I need help. I, I need to put down all these fancy ideas that I have about myself and apprentice myself to someone in a different way, you know, mm -hmm. to actually go and say, listen, I don't know. I can't do this, this thing you do and I need help. And I, I, I just need to put down any idea I might have about myself how smart I am, how educated I am, how professional I am, and really kind of step into that space and say, you know, I'm here to learn. 
you know, I'm going to take, I'm, I'm going to, that's how I'm coming into this. And that was very different than how I'd done anything before. And it was really how it was, it, it was set up and it had to be that way, which I, you know, Scott knew right at the get go that that's how it had to be. And so when I reinitiated contact with him, you know, that was really the starting point. Um, it was for him, for me, I was still trying to negotiate a place in there where I knew what I was talking about, <laughs> but he, he was very direct and honest with me from the very beginning, even then. And I, I had to, the first part of the book, the bigger picture is really me. You know, I had learned that lesson on my own that I didn't know and I wasn't going to find out and, and, and I needed help, but you know, you can, you can admit things to yourself in your head. And then you, you step into trying to fix it, but it's another thing to be able to say it out loud. Cause of course, when mm -hmm. it's in your head, it's not real yet because you can make excuses or rationalizations or you can dance around different things. But the first part of a bigger picture is just me really coming to terms with the fact that I have to put that out in the world now and actually take the feedback, you know, to be able to say, I don't know. And, and, you know, the first, the first couple of chapters of the book are really my first trip to see Scott when, when he was in Cape Coral, Florida, where we spent three days, some total with him working with me just really to get me to say, I don't, I don't know what the hell I'm talking about or what I'm doing. And I really need help, you know? And, you know, you can read that story and, and it's, it, it, it was, it was a challenging experience to go through. Um, I, you know, what I, I tell people is it's also the, the point in my life where I actually started to learn for the first time. Before then, I was gathering information and, and, and was educating myself and was, you know, and was, and was feeling smart. But it was only at that place where I had to say, listen, I, I don't know. I just don't know. I don't understand and I need help. That was the point where I actually started to learn. And that was a huge, huge deal at the time. I didn't really realize it because, again, I'm a slow learner. So I tend to learn these incredible lessons. And then I have to move down the road a piece, turn around and look at them and to be able to see them. And it was a very long process of this um, that went on like a chess match of sorts. Not much of a chess match, you know, <laughs> but a chess match. And it went on like this until, uh, you know, it, it was a, a drama. And, and Scott calls it a maturity drama is really what it was because he knew where he wanted me to be at the end. And he just simply held me in one spot and didn't allow me to act out. He didn't allow me to rationalize. He didn't allow me to do all of the things I normally did in order to get my needs met, in order to get what I wanted, which was to feel like the smartest mm -hmm. guy in the room, but to feel intelligent, to feel like I had a hold of things. And he basically kept me in a situation where I couldn't get that need met. And then he kept demanding that I, I feel something in the middle of that. And when you're an intellectual and you're that disassociated from your feelings, that's an incredibly stressful dynamic. And we simply stayed in that place until um, I felt uh, until I, you know, I, I could level into my feelings. And when, when, and you know, and you may have talked about this in your program already, but that idea about leveling, um, when the words that come out of your mouth match how you actually feel, the reality of what's going on inside you, where you're not, the words that come out of your mouth aren't um, an effort to hide that or to distort it or to change it in some way. And it wasn't until I got to that point. And then, and then from there could actually say out loud, you know, that I, I can't do this. I can't do what you do. You know, I'm, I need, I need help. Um, mm -hmm. So he basically took away all of your magic tricks, right? All of the ways you were distracting mm -hmm. from loving. I've been through my own personal version of this with Scott. Mm -hmm. The thing about him is yeah. he'll, well, he is so passionate about you getting what you need more so mm -hmm. than you are. So he'll keep going and he'll do it. As, <laughs> as, how long does it take? As long as it takes. He'll do as it takes. Whatever it takes. And, and yeah. he knows that it's worth it because it, once you get to the other end, that's when things change. But you, you, And that is really one of the, big, the lessons in the bigger picture is, is 
it really, that idea that as long as, how long will it take is as long as it takes. And, and as a helper, one of the things we need to be able to do is whatever needs to be done in there. It was an amazingly intricate, um, uh, caring um, uh, process that took me where I needed to be. It was just a matter of how, how much fight I had in me before we got there. And for anybody who knows Scott, you can have as much fight as you want in you. He's got a little more. So <laughs> you're going to, you, you're eventually going to get where you need to be. So, and you figure that out as you go along. So. Tell us a little bit about um, when you look at psychology and traditional therapy and the work that you did with your patients or that your colleagues did. Um, tell us uh, what you're, now that you know what you know and you've had this experience, how do you view that? There's just so much anger and, and, and aggression and frustration and, and violence and just kind of nastiness. We don't really know how to get along with each other anymore. We don't really know how to um, take responsibility for ourselves in the world. We, we, we've lost track of this. And one of the things that, that psychology, mental health, at least in the States, has always done is really looked at you know, the, our rates of anxiety and depression, uh, relationship problems, marital issues, uh, you know, the whole gamut of psychopathology. And, and they're looking at this like it's a mental health problem. You know, in the States now, you'll get these stories that what we're having is a mental health crisis because, of course, 2020 really wore us down to the nub. We're just not coping well anymore. And now we have this crisis of depression and anxiety and, and all of these other um, problems that are psychological disorders. And the big thing that I've, I've gotten from my work with Scott is that I don't think anymore we have a mental health crisis. What I think we have is a crisis of maturity and that what has happened over time is that um, sometime in the, maybe the late 1980s, this idea began to, to show up that you as an individual shouldn't ever have to experience anything you don't want to experience. You shouldn't ever have to feel anything you don't want to feel. You shouldn't ever have to take feedback that you find icky to hear. You shouldn't ever have to have to deal with ideas or perspectives that, that, that you don't like listening to or that don't make you feel good. And this idea kind of grew and mutated until um, the, uh, the culture changed with it. Um, you know, we're, we're in a place now where these really, you know, it, it started as an idea, but it really is the norm here now uh, that nobody should have to feel anything they don't want to feel or do anything they don't want to do. No one should ever be exposed to feedback from reality. As a matter of fact, you don't have to take anything from reality at all. You can simply deny it or criminalize it or, um, you know, you can refuse it outright, you know, it, whatever it is. And over time, you know, the, the culture has changed and, and we're raising our children differently now. And, and, you know, at least two generations of children have, have come into the world thinking that this is the way life's supposed to work. Um, and what's re even more disturbing is even the folks that are old enough to have known this lesson. I mean, I'm in my fifties. So this is, so when, when I grew up, uh, you, you were responsible for yourself. You didn't tattle. You always carried your own water. No one else had to take care of you. Never acted out. You never made other human beings carry you when times were tough. Th this was a different place. But even people who are my age who learned those lessons growing up are starting to kind of surrender into this idea that they shouldn't have to feel these things anymore, which is kind of common sense because the idea that you don't you, you don't have to take responsibility for yourself in the world is really an idea that sells itself, <laughs> you know. And, and what we are right now is we have a crisis of maturity that we're, we're, we're inside a, a, a system now where, um, you know, that, that definition of maturity is the ability to tolerate frustrated desire alone. Nobody should have to tolerate frustrated desire at all. If you're tolerating frustrated desire, something's wrong with them or something's wrong with you but it's not an expectation anymore of the way people should be. And the result of that 
is what we call a mental health. Not now, not all. I, I'm not saying that. Please hear that there are there are mental health issues. There are um, actual biological uh, mental health problems, and we could go into that on in another thing if you wanted to. But there are there are actual mental health disorders. Um, you know, that are, that, that, that appear to be largely biological in nature. But a great deal of what we're, we're calling a mental health problem now is really a, 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 a maturity problem. It, it, people are unable to tolerate frustrated desire alone and unwilling to tolerate frustrated desire alone. And the result of that is, is epic rates of depression and anxiety and unhappiness and, and anger and um, interpersonal problems and the inability to get along with others, uh, the inability to find your way in the world, to make something out of your life, uh, you know, more existential type of things, the, the struggle to find meaning. These are all side effects. They're not the problem. They're the symptoms of the problem, which is ironic when you think about it. They're the symptoms of a cultural um, lack of maturity. And that's really, as far as how I think about psychology and my work with Scott, that's, that's the, from a big picture, that's what I would describe. If we look at the world of psychology or therapy or, or people who are mental health professionals, there's so many well-meaning people who are very passionate about what they do and they really care often they're attracted to that kind of work because they had struggles. And I know that would be true mm-hmm. for me. I was attracted to mm-hmm. helping people with hypnosis mm-hmm. because I had my own struggles and it helped me. Mm-hmm. Um, and so if they haven't had this maturing experience and they've been trained a certain way that doesn't look at things this way, then they can't deliver that experience to their clients either. Well, and, and you as somebody who long history of, of working with people inside this system, you know, so much of, of what is needed in the world and so much of what we do is really a process of, of just helping them mature, dealing with some big picture, universal maturity tasks. And they, and we help them deal with that. And then whatever the, the, the smoking, the weight, the stress is kind of details around that. Does that make sense to you? Mm-hmm. You know, our the, the task really is is to help people mature and help them um, grow up and learn to tolerate frustrated desire alone without, and, and generally speaking, from a big picture, what human beings tend to do if they're not going to tolerate frustrated desire alone is they, they tend to move either into anger or into self-pity of some kind. And so our place very frequently when they come in with the complaint of, I want to change X is to help them be able to deal with frustrated desire without either moving into anger and then using that as the rationalization for why X, Y, and Z happen or moving into self pity and using that as the reason for why X, Y, and Z, why I do this or don't do that or think this or think that. And it really is from the big picture, just a task of, parenting people of helping them grow up. Um, and I don't mean any disrespect when I say that, that that there is a definition, a workable definition of maturity, a functional definition of maturity, that idea, it's the ability to tolerate frustrated desire alone. And that one sentence is so important and it's so absent, you know, that I, you know, if someone asked me, what are the, what are the causes for human suffering? And one of them is the, the, they can't tolerate frustrated desire alone. And secondly, they think they're special and therefore they're an exemption to the idea that they should have to tolerate frustrated desire alone. I think those two things are responsible for 99% of human suffering from a big picture. I think it's kind of that simple. Yeah. And and our task is to, yeah, get in and take care of that and, and help. What experiences do they need to have to step beyond that? And in the process of doing that, they learn all kinds of fabulous things and interesting skills and other problems that they're able to deal with more effectively, whatever that is. But the core of what we do is somewhere in the orbit of those two things, I think. 
I know. So, so I know part of your mission is to educate people in the mental health field in in this, so that they can be more prepared to genuinely give people this experience and this growth. And I'm curious about what kind of um, reception you've gotten from people who work in mental health. Well, you know, if you listen to the, if. You, <laughs> If I think back to the first part of this interview where I talked about how smart I needed to be and how intellectual I was and how um, you can't, when you think you're that smart, it's hard to learn anything, which is why I'm, to this day, I'm still a slow learner because of just the gravity of having had that in me for so long. Um, you, that is, that is the problem with moving something like this into the, into the helping field to psychology, to clinicians is the idea that in order to really learn this, these ideas we're talking about, you have to, you have to believe a couple of things. And one is, is that you don't already know it, you know, which is a knee jerk reaction for many people is that, Oh, I, I kind of know that I get it you know, they hear what you're saying and it registers with them a little bit. And so, oh, well, yeah, I, I got what you're saying. And that's always really hard for me to hear because, you know, I, I, when I hear that, I, 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 you know, I become concerned that maybe that they didn't really hear me. Um, so that's one piece. And the second piece is, is to, is to actually be able to take in a bit of information and not feel like you get, you're entitled to judge it as right or wrong to really be able to take in a learning and, and to try it, to take it in, surrender into it, accept it, and then try to live it and then learn the lesson that needs to be learned rather than deciding up front what it is and then determining what you're going to do or not do at that point in time, which is so much of what academically educated people do. Oh, I get this. This makes sense. This doesn't. I'm going to use this. I know where I'm going to do that. The rest of this is, is and it isn't of any importance. Boom, done. But back to that idea of apprenticeship, of mentorship, the real genius of, of what we call emulation learning is to take in a learning, put yourself in the back seat, your fancy ideas about you. Get rid of them for a second. Take that in, surrender into it, and then go out and live that. Do it. And that in, it's inside that piece that's where the real work learning is. That's where the interesting things happen. That's where the change is. That's where the growth is. That's where everything valuable is. And if you if you show up at the beginning and and shortcut that whole process, you know, all all you're doing is robbing yourself. A lot of people have had the experience in their life, and, and let's take, you know, people who have, like, here we have colleges, so we have the College of Psychotherapists, we have, uh, you know, a medical college, for example, and so because they have their degree and that um, recognition from the college and they're following the rules of the college, there's this illusion that it gives some, uh, it, it, it actually means that what they're doing is uh, the most useful, and so I think that that's a big thing that gets in the way because people have a lot of pride caught up in that or, or safety, like they're afraid and they're used to the way things are. And so the idea of switching that can be very jarring for them. And I, I, I'm thinking of uh, one student I had who was working in the mental health field. And for her, the idea of giving people a guarantee, like when as hypnotists, when we deliver our services, we give people a written guarantee that says if they do need extra help, then it's free. It's part of their program for their original outcome. Mm -hmm. And her reaction to that was really negative because she, she was just used to being paid by the hour. And that's just the way it is. And it was not, there was no attachment between the work she was doing and actual proof that the person was getting results. Right. And so, and not to her, she is a very well-meaning person. It wasn't her fault at mm -hmm. all, but because her whole uh, profession does it that way and the college says, this is how you do it. And the insurance companies 
take care of it that way. And, and the third party pay is something that gets in the way too, because if somebody says, oh, sure, insurance will cover it, I'll go see a therapist. They're, they don't really have enough skin in the game to, to take responsibility for what's going on. And so there's a whole systemic issue here. Um, and because people are yeah. forced to follow these rules, they become less resilient because they're relying on the rules instead of having them make it happen themselves. And I think you're right. I mean, you talked about pride. You talked about, you know, not knowing how else to do it. And, and then the rules, all the education that's been poured into you about the right way to do things, the only way to do things, you know, and, and it's a combination of, of all of that that makes it difficult to, to be open enough to even consider something else, you know, not to mention just, just the fear of, of, of the unknown, you know? Um, but I agree with you in, in what you said that one of the problems that, that this, the psychology field has is a lack of skin in the game. Shout out here to, uh, Nassim Taleb, who, who talks about this idea of skin in the game. And if you've never read his books, uh, consider doing so. Um, they're amazing. But one of the things that I would say about that is back to you talking about the guarantee, you know, psychology, we spend a lot of time talking about professionalism and ethics and things like that. Um, I think that offering a guarantee is one of the most ethical things you could do. Absolutely. I mean, to say, listen, we're going to agree on something here, and if I can't get you to it in what we agreed on, then this is what I'm going to do to, to make that whole again. Um, and, and the fact that psychology really struggles with that, you know, is, is in my head a, um, a sign of how muddled things have become. You know, there's lots of pieces of what happens in, in psychotherapy that reflects the fact that, that the field doesn't have the kind of skin in the game that it should have. Um, simply put one of, from a, from a big picture perspective, psychotherapy doesn't really accept responsibility for the outcome that the other person came in for, you know, hypnotists. One of the first thing you do is you, you figure out what the outcome is and you say, okay, this is how, you know, I'm, I'm going to help you with this and this is what it's going to look like. And this is how long we're going to do it. And this is how much it's going to cost. And, and then there's a guarantee at the end of that. If you need extra help, we're going to do that. And it's not going to cost you anything. And however, you're going to handle that. Um, psychology doesn't do that in any real sense. And it's back to that fear that we talked about a minute ago that makes learning difficult is the act of actually accepting responsibility just a reasonable amount of responsibility. You know, I'm not suggesting that, 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 that the client or patient doesn't have skin in the game either. They, they need to. And the way and hypnotism, when done right, keeps them in that place. But, but the, the clinician has to have responsibility for the outcome. And one of the things that psychology really has put itself together in a way and, and functions in a way that allows it to really avoid any actual responsibility for the outcome. And I think, I mean, if we're going to talk about professionalism and ethics and things like that, that's a discussion that needs to be had um, because there, there isn't any actual reality-based responsibility on behalf of, 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 a, of a psychotherapist for what happens. I mean, they, they're going to, not in any real sense as far as the outcome of the person and the money they're spending and all. And the things that we would expect in any other market transaction that we engage in, you know, any other for some reason uh education therapy medicine that there we see them as kind of a, a different ball game when one of the things we need to do is we, we all need to have skin in the game the same way we'd be if we went to a mechanic the same way if you've got a carpenter to come in and work on your house the same rules if the same rules applied tomorrow by the end of next week the only people that would be working in the field would be the ones who are effective and we're the ones, we're the ones very, who are willing. We're the ones who are willing to learn and realize, wow, this yeah, shows absolutely. me how much I have to yeah. learn. Because I know for me, like early in my career as a hypnotist, the thing that got me to to learn the most was when 
things weren't working with clients. And I realized, ha, oh, I, I have to get better at this. And, you know, <laughs> I, I had to face it. It was it, it was right there in front of me. The truth is that a lot of hypnotists don't operate this way either. So so there, they, there's this whole philosophy we have with Master Hypnotist Society about this Mm-hmm. idea of maturity and having that accountability that helps people really hone their skills and focus on results and and being willing to honestly look at what's really happening. A lot of people really want to learn, but what it turns into is that they're shopping for more techniques. So they're going to learn yeah. this technique and that technique and take this course and that course. And so they're having this illusion of learning or making progress, but they're just doing the same thing and over and over again. Yeah. And, you know, and, and the sad thing about it is it, it, is it, you know, I think a lot of people realize they, they, there's things that they need to learn or there's things that they should get better at or there's skills they should have. But one of the things that's happened to us is we don't even know anymore how to learn. You know, this idea of emulation learning, and then really in, in, in all seriousness, emulation learning is the only learning there is, real learning. Um, everything else is just information. That's all it is. Um and we've forgotten that. We don't realize it anymore. And and so people are really, to a large degree, kind of flying blind. They mm-hmm. they may think that something's missing. They may want something else, but they don't really know how to do it. And so, you know, when we meet them, we kind of have to have to just show them relatively quickly the value of this and hope that they catch on because you know we've we really have forgotten how to learn. We've lost track of it and we don't know. And it's in, and so even if you are looking for help, it makes help harder to find and harder to take when you do find it. And, Mm -hmm. and, you know, I wish it wasn't that way, but it is. So, but that can be different. Yeah. Right. And listen, you and I both have gone through this and, and I get it. And I, I really feel for people who are stuck this way. I think Mm -hmm. it's a really uncomfortable place to be. Um, I, I'm very thankful that I found Scott and this approach because it, it gave me a path to feel really good about the service I'm delivering to people and know that I'm giving value mm-hmm. and have challenges for myself to keep growing. Um, and so I, you know, my hope is that more and more people will be able to get this kind of help so that we can help more people because the more hypnotists or therapists that get trained in this ability to, to give people a maturity experience, the more people we can actually help. Right. You can reach me at um, Sioux Falls Hypnosis is the name of my website. My phone number and, and information is right there. Um, and I also have a Facebook page. You can look up at my name, Daniel Bureau, and that's B-U-R-O-W. And those are the, that's the primary way to get a hold of me. I look forward to hearing from anybody. Happy to answer any questions anyone has. Great. Well, thanks so much. I know I learned a lot today and also from reading your book. So I strongly encourage people to, uh, as soon as Dan's book comes out, which is, is it mid-May that it's coming out? Yeah, it should be maybe, I'm guessing six or seven weeks now, timeline. All right. So Fingers crossed. Mid to late May. Yeah. So stay in touch with Dan so you can get a copy of his book. You will learn a lot. And my hope is that it inspires people to seek out the kind of learning experiences that will help them truly live a, 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 a meaningful life and a connected life. And that this is true not just as a therapist or a hypnotist, but your personal relationships, your uh, ability to mm-hmm. realize your potential is at stake. Right. So the book again is called The Bigger Picture. It should be available at Amazon and and I think barnesandnoble.com. Uh, you'll be able to search it by my name, again, B-U-R-O-W, and, and uh, have a read. And I, if you do get a chance to read it in the future and send me an email or give me a call, I'd love to hear what you think. But thanks for your time today. I appreciate it. Great. Thanks, Dan. Join us for next week's podcast, where we will be answering your questions about meditation, yoga, and hypnosis, such as, is meditation a form of hypnosis? Is yoga hypnosis? How does yoga and other physical movement help you with emotional healing and growth? How does physical movement help you change your state of mind? 
Hypnotist and yoga instructor Kelly Lupe Smith will be with us to explore these questions and more and share how hypnosis and yoga have helped her on her own healing journey. Remember to click the button to subscribe and please leave us a review so you can help others to benefit from the podcast too. Until next week. You've been listening to The Hypnosis Show with Robbie Spear Miller. Tune in next time to learn more about how you can change your life with hypnosis. And if you are interested in learning more about training opportunities, go to hypnosistrainingcanada.com and schedule a free consultation.